East 9th, oh, that would be West 9th Street, apparently down that way. That's where the First Baptist Church was located mm -hmm. originally, where the Central Library stands, and there were black people all in that area. Mm -hmm. And then there evidently were black people who lived, uh, shall we say, south of 6th Street, in that direction because there was a black school located down at 5th and West Avenue. It was called the West Avenue School. Okay. And so I would think that uh, the black businesses located on East 6th Street were, were related to the fact that we had uh, the black uh, people living in the central city. Right, nearby. As, right. And you're also saying, though, something else, if I understood you correctly. In this same period of time, from 1890 to 1920, there was a significant increase in the number of blacks living in Austin, right? Well, um, I, I think that perhaps what we, we are seeing about those businesses was related perhaps to, it could include the migration of blacks into Austin, say, by that time. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, the migration of blacks uh, started, uh, the rapid migration perhaps started somewhere near and around uh, 1900 because those Jim Crow laws were passed in 1906. Okay. And I feel that they were definitely related to the increase in black population. Mm -hmm. right. But I think the location of the businesses would be related to the fact that blacks lived that way. They even lived on uh, First Street, and then you see we had Mason Town and all around. So you have that was related. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the black businesses are probably uh, are viewing a concentration there in the 400 block um, of uh, East Sex. You see, you go on down further there, you will find the Tears Funeral Home down, I think, in the 200 block. Okay. And then we go uh, move south just a block, and we will find another uh, uh, funeral home on Natchez, between okay. Natchez and Fifth. So here, and then as, as you move up looking, uh, North, we would find some carriage companies or some kind of a black business uh, in that direction up, up there a block away. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Well, would you say that the 400 block is unusual in its concentration of black entrepreneurs in this period, or that there were other sites in that nearby area that where the concentration was just as great? And what about on Congress? I have never known of any black businesses being on Congress, but I did know of a black uh, barber shop that was somewhere off Congress. I think it was on 7th, mm -hmm. and that was Bob Harrison's barber shop I heard of. But okay. then we look at the 200 block on uh, uh, West 6, and I think that was the Brewer barber shop described there. So uh, uh, one of the things I think you might well know is that uh, recognizes that Austin was in its developmental stages. And so freedom of enterprise uh, was very much uh, a part of the, the original planning. Mm -hmm. uh, if the people had the money and had the ambition and the talent, uh, I, don't, I don't feel that they were prohibited. Do you feel that that changed in Austin? Yes. When? It changed and in why? 1906 with, the, uh, with those Jim Crow laws. That was the beginning of the change. Okay, but we don't see that happening on our block. There seems to be a long lag time on our block after those Jim Crow laws. Well, as you know, it isn't going to be. Uh, uh, that's not going. You know, you aren't going to feel the effect right. immediately. Mm -hmm. But it, there will be a progression. You, as you, there were other things that were happening. I think uh, along with that, for for many years, you see, we had this concentration. Uh, that was the beginning. We're looking at the beginning. We are. Yeah, we're looking at the beginning here. And we're looking at the way of the early black citizens uh, manifested themselves, you know, and their talents. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel there was a great deal of freedom involved in this. No one was trying to circumscribe them. There were no efforts on the part of the city to circumscribe people. Uh, the emphasis was on the development of the city, mm -hmm. uh, whether you are, uh, uh, no matter what your extraction is. Mm -hmm. This is a development of services. I don't, I don't feel as we look at this that people are being hurt. Uh -huh. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what happens then in the 1920s and 30s? Does that begin changing? Oh, yes. Changes. Uh, uh, you, the changes, uh, let's look, uh, we have, uh, say, the development of uh, what you might think of as an East Austin that would uh, begin developing in the early 1900s. 
you have the uh, infiltration of blacks moving eastward, where they had been formerly concentrated in Central City. Mm-hmm. In 1900, we began to look at them moving uh, eastward. I think 1900 is a pretty good cutoff date for us to begin to, to think about changes, mm-hmm. minimal changes beginning. Mm-hmm. And that grow in emphasis and flourish later on. All right, and now we need to look, you see. As we look at black subcontinent, even in the central city, we look at all of that. We look at that churches, the earliest churches being located in the central, in the central city. city. Mm-hmm. You see, the first Baptist church, uh, for black people was located in the third ward there where the uh, central library stands. I see. Uh, okay. That church was uh, organized in 1867 and perhaps the earliest building maybe went up between uh, somewhere in the 1870s right on that site. And then we'll go uh, to see Wesley Chapel Church. It was located where you see First Baptist Church standing today. It was located on Ninth Street. Mm-hmm. Wesley Chapel, you said. Uh, yeah, but it's Wesley. They call it Wesley United Methodist mm-hmm. Church today. And then look at Metropolitan. That was located, Metropolitan Amy Church, was located in the same section there by First Baptist Church where the library stands. Mm-hmm. That's, that's San Antonio and down right in there. Then there was a concentration of black people, you see. They were living all over in there. Mm-hmm. And my mother came to Austin in 1903, and Wildridge Park was accessible to all people. Mm-hmm. The Captain Browns. So this was the concentration. This is where the people, early uh, black people, early black families lived, Central City. Right. Now, so you begin to see, you asked yes. about changes. You begin to see changes. You see, the, uh, uh, in the late 1920s, that would be when the Metropolitan Church moved to the East Austin. Uh, I'd say they moved, I, I guess, let me see. It took the early 1920s, I guess. They moved out. And then... Uh, and they probably did not move until they realized that their their population had moved away from them. Well, I'm certain that that was related. Uh, then First Baptist Church did not remain on that uh, site uh, there by the Central Library for too long. They built a another church in 1895 on the corner of Red Ribbon 14th Street. And it stood there until 1951, you see, before and today, Baton Rouge Hospital occupies that complete two-block deal all around, more than two blocks. It's from 14 to 16 to the expressway. So there are all of these things that they want. Um, I'd like to hear about your parents, Molly and Thomas Perry. Well, uh, <laughs> I assume that my father came to Austin before 1900. Uh, Where was he born? He was born in Leon County. In Texas? Yes. Uh, What were his parents' occupations? His uh, father was uh, a farmer. The youngest land there in Leon County? Yes, he owned quite a bit of acreage. Why did your your father come to Austin? You know, I don't know why he came to Austin. I... uh, um, my, let me tell you that my father had died when I was five years of age so that I did not have an opportunity to interview him about all of these kinds of things. My, my mother said that he'd, uh, he left home at 17, he and a friend, and that they went first to San Antonio, and he did not like San Antonio, and he came to Austin, the friend stayed in San Antonio. father then died about 1918? No, he died in 1919. 1919. Yes. How did he get into the barbering business? I don't, I don't have the slightest idea as to how he got into that business. I believe that he worked first, well, one of the early places that he worked was at Boston State Hospital. So uh, I do not know how he got into that. Uh, how, well, but I did notice that as I uh, visited with uh, uh, some of his brothers later in life, some of them uh, did some barbering in the community. I don't know. They may have had special skill. I his don't know. brothers lived here? No, no. They he did. Lived in the He's they the only one that ever lived here. Do you know whether your father had any training uh, to prepare him for becoming a barber? Uh, I surely do not. I couldn't, couldn't say whether he had any training to do that. But his brothers were barbers, too. Well, he had, had that was one I know that did some barbering then. That was, uh, that was one of the younger brothers that did some barbering out there at the Ryan 
in the community, and I don't know that he had a shop, but apparently he did some bargaining in the community. I picked him up on the block then some years after he immigrated to Austin. Well, uh, he I picked him up in 1912 to 1918. Well, he was on that block in 1907. We have uh, evidence of his being uh, a partner in the business. It was Matthews and Perry in 1907. So I do not know. I'd have to go to the city directory to, to determine when they opened their business. But uh, by 1912, when he married my mother, he was the sole owner of the business. So uh, he was the sole owner of the business that began as Matthews and right, Perry. Right. Okay. He was the sole owner of the business by 1912, I know. And I, we have the evidence the name of the shop then was the Parlor Barbershop. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. The yeah. Parlor the pile of Irish. When he became the sole owner, oh, became I take, yeah, because okay. when I first saw the name, it was Matthews and Perry, and then after he was the sole owner, I see it's the pile of Irish. Uh -huh. And 406, and I'm sure that's the address you must have, yes. 406. Uh, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Now I have 416. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll have to recheck. Well, maybe I made a typo too, but I would like to recheck that. I can recheck, uh -huh. sure. Uh, my mother sold the barbershop to a lady. She sold the business because he did, my father did not own the building. He uh, leased the building okay. from Wilbur Allen, a man named Wilbur Allen. Okay, and Wilbur Allen was the owner of the yeah, building? apparently, but yeah. A-L-L-E-N, you yeah, think? think? Okay. Mm -hmm. So my mother sold this business about, I don't know whether it's 1921 or 1922, to, Mrs., to a Miss Sarah Russell. Uh -huh. and did Miss Russell then operate the business as a barbershop? I, I assume that she did. I know that she was a hairdresser. As a hairdresser? Yes, yeah, she did my she had done my hair, so I know she was a hairdresser. She was also, I suppose, a teacher. Uh -huh. Sarah Russell. Do you have any idea how long she stayed in business no, at I that time? Not. I really do not. I just know that she's the person who bought the business. Uh -huh. um, I gathered from talking to you earlier that your mother ran the business no. shortly. No. no. She sold it. She sold it. They were the, uh, I'm sure she kept it for a barber. My father had, there were several other barbers in that. He was not the only barber. There were three or four other barbers in the business. So that, uh, Someone she, right, she could afford to, to operate it, mm -hmm. have it operated, but she never went in. She was the business not. Okay. No, no, no. She is listed. Yeah, she's the owner. Yeah. She is. She's listed. Uh, is your mother named Molly? Yes. She's listed in the 1920 city directory. Right, well, she still had the business. Uh -huh, so, uh -huh, but but she was not a barber. Okay. You know. That's good to clear up. She was the wife of the barber. So shortly after his death, in two to three years, she went on and sold uh, the Yes, she sold the business. But since he had other partners, they more or less took over the operation. Uh, well, no, they, weren't part, uh, they were not partners, you know, they were just uh, people, I think, rented spaces, as they do today. They rent a space in your in the shop. Mm -hmm. And then the owner gets, uh, uh, they either pay for the space or you would get a percentage of the proceeds or something. So I don't know exactly what. Okay. But I do know that one thing, my father had a couple of, uh, I've heard my mother say, a couple of uh, bath facilities. Mm -hmm. And so that the men who uh, perhaps work downtown could come in and uh, pay a fee and take a bath and dress. In that but same in, site? In the site, he had a couple of bath facilities. I don't uh -huh. know whether there were a couple, a couple of tubs, I assume, mm -hmm. of bath facilities, and they could uh, pay and take a bath and dress and like get their hair or they were all good. Yes. Uh -huh. I well, thought that was kind of uh, interesting. Yes, very yeah. interesting, because I have come across several of these people listed as owners of baths, and I was curious to know what that meant, well, and often case, they're in conjunction with something else. Right, well, in this case, that's what that, that's what uh -huh. that meant. Uh -huh. I never saw the bath, but I don't know. I, I just retained that little bit of information. Uh -huh. I've just cataloged that little bit of information. Tucked it upstairs. Right. <laughs> well, you said that you alluded to having seen evidence earlier that he became the sole owner in 1912, and it became the parlor shop. Do you have, are you talking about receipts or bills or uh, uh, I, uh, what is this evidence you were referring to? Well, I have a lease paper that he had to lease. What can you get? What does it look like? Well, oh, just a regular lease. It is on the care of the name of the person who you lease from and the date. It's a regular lease. Okay, 
Okay. When we talked on the phone the other day, we also discussed Pinkney A. Williams. Yes, Mr. Williams. I'd like to talk to him. I'd like to talk about him for a little bit, and I'd also like to see if you recognize the names of any of these other people on this list. Uh, let's talk about Mr. Williams. Well, I know that he was the um, the, uh, the uh, director of American Woodland. Uh -huh. uh, that's what I. That's the way I know him best. And it, approximately when would he have been the director of American Woodland? Do you? <laughs> no, I guess you can look in the city director and uh, telephone book and see. Uh, okay. You know, I just know that that was uh, what he. That was uh, kind of an insurance. It was a professional insurance or a that, businessman's insurance uh, organization. Just, just, just a regular insurance that people belong to. Okay. Well, not to work. Okay. It was a black insurance. Yeah. Right. It had a great following. And I guess if you uh, wanted. To it's still in existence in Denver, Colorado. They do not have an office here, but they're in Denver, Colorado. Uh -huh. So those of us who have the policies with them, you know, mm -hmm. come to Denver. But it was exclusively for blacks? Well, uh, as far as I know, just uh -huh. all I can say is a black insurance. You know, it's, it's, it's okay. I'm sure, I guess they would insure other people uh -huh. if they wanted to, but predominantly. Okay. Uh, but not black insurance, I think. Uh, you mentioned that Mr. Williams' son became a Houston judge, yes, is that right? Yes, What is his name? Francis is what I understand people to say his name is. How did I know him? He's one of the younger ones. But, uh -huh. but you think he's in, in Houston now? I know he is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know he is in Houston. Okay. That's, a, that's a fact. Uh -huh. um, do you happen to know what Mr. Williams' training was or anything no, else about him? I picked him up as a real estate agent and an insurance salesman, and he did a couple of other activities. And I picked him up late on the block, 1918, 1920, was when he entered the area. Oh, I don't really know. He, he, well, he was in the area. I don't know. I don't know whether he always. I don't know whether the that business. Whether he was always in that business. But his family was born here in Austin, as far as I know. The children, uh, all of his children. You're talking about Pinkney's children, or? Himself. His children. His children. Okay. Okay. His children. So I figured they lived in Mason Town. That was where their residence was. I don't know whether that was third or second, but you certainly could check the uh, telephone directory of that vintage and it would say where their, their residence was, but it was Mason Town. Okay. Do you see any other names on this list that you recognize? Well, I recognize Dr. Abner. Did you know him? No, I just knew he was a doctor. He was the name of the doctors. Uh -huh. And he left Austin, uh, around, I guess, uh, before 1920, around 1920, he moved to Denver, Colorado. Uh -huh. And he was associated with the American Woodland, so I don't know whether he continued to practice medicine or what. Uh -huh. uh, do you know why he left Austin? No, no. He went to Denver went to, to practice. Denver. Uh -huh. I don't know. Really, I guess he practiced there. I don't know really Do you happen to know who his wife was? I thought the people said her name was Maud. Maud Abner. Okay. I thought that was what I heard the people say. You've never heard of uh, the name Phoebe associated with him, his wife? No. Yeah. Was that uh, what you found? I'm having trouble remembering. You know, Phoebe was either his wife or it might have been his daughter's name. Oh, you wouldn't it. be mixing it up with something else, would you? Maybe. Yeah, because the, the Phoebe was in the, there's a Phoebe in the Strain family. So I didn't know, but that was not business. So I don't know, I don't know. But uh, more of, I thought okay. that's what I heard people pretend it is best I remember. Do you know anything about Dr. Andrew's background? No. no I should have. I know that he was a practicing physician in Austin. Anything about this paper called Austin Watchman either. First it said 1905, 1906. Surely would like to see a copy of it. <laughs> I haven't found a copy yet. I'd like mm. to see one too. Uh, we have a copy of the first black newspaper. It's called The Gold Dollar. And that one was done by Jacob Fontaine. 
and of course it's registered in Washington. When was that published? Do you remember? I'd have to be looking at that to tell you. But that was published in the 1800s, in the late 1800s. Uh -huh. And it was the first black newspaper. Crawford, I don't, can't tell you anything about it, except I can tell you what church he was to. Well, tell me that. He was a member of Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh -huh. I think we read him the superintendent of that Sunday school. Uh -huh. And well, Dr. Allen was a member of Wesley, I think, Wesley United Methodist Church. And, of course, Mr. P.A. Williams was a member of the First Baptist Church, and that was my father's church also, First Baptist. Gibbons was a dentist, and his uh, office was up over uh, the Delashua drugstore upstairs, over that drugstore that's in that building. And he was down there for a long time. You have to 1920, but he was there. Uh, way up in the years. I don't think he moved out East Austin until uh, maybe the 50s, 60s, 50s or 60s. So Very late. He was down there for a uh, while. Really? In that same site? Yes. I didn't go past 1922, oh, so that's... <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh -huh. And he went to Western United Methodist Church. And probably held some uh, outstanding, played some outstanding roles in the church. I know he's active there. Mm -hmm. He did. You happen to know where he got his dental degree? I don't, I don't know, Rob. Uh, no, I'm not sure. But I'm sure you can find that out. <laughs> and, uh, there, yeah, are, there are people who know him uh, very well. He may have left those those documents somewhere around. We uh let's let me see if Liz has that book up here, we might find something in we have some reference books around that might tell where he got his degree, uh without collected here in the beginning your file on each one of these individuals. Here's Dr. Crawford. This shows his tenure there on the block, but only through 1920. Well, I don't remember him after that, but we have a picture of him also in that book, and there's probably uh -huh. information about Dr. Crawford. His wife is one of, no, his daughter is one of my teachers. Uh-huh. second grade. Um, so his children... At least one daughter. I know one daughter taught at that Gregory School. Mm -hmm. I don't remember her name. I just know it's Dr. Crawford's daughter. Well, for your information, I found in this article right here, Dr. Crawford, that he studied medicine in Shaw University, Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, that's for Dr. Crawford. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And at the University of Chicago. Well, and if you find, go find, to find this one every given past, you might find out about him. Uh -huh. But I think that, uh, That's his obituary. Did you know any of his other children? No, I did not. I don't know. Did they give those? I think they may have named his survivors. Wife and two children, daughter. Mm -hmm. 
Marguerite, that was the teacher. Yes, and it says here, the Gregory Town Public Schools, mm -hmm. and his son Walter Carlton, student in the medical department of Howard University. Mm -hmm. If you want to take place at Ebenezer Tabernacle at noon Wednesday, Dr. L. O. Campbell. Good night. That was 1924. Jeez, sweet. Long time ago. Yeah, he must have died young man. I don't know. He was a very portly looking man. Let's see if Lewis has one of those books. You can see his picture. He was a very fine looking man. Uh, which book are you talking about? Uh, the mm -hmm. Metropolitan. Yeah, he, yeah here's one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this isn't, but this isn't, this is something else. We have a, but here's every given. And here's Dr. Abner, mm -hmm. Dr. Stevens, Dr. Brown, and Dr. Delashaw. Now you took these out of what about the Delta Sigma book. Punishing Delta Sigma Theta. Uh -huh. right. That's Delta Sigma Theta. You put, put another <laughs> part on that. <laughs> theta. Oh yeah, that's why you put that in there. Oh, and it is over here. Now Mr. Jennings was the man who owned the drugstore before Dr. Delashwa. Right. But I can't tell you anything about Mr. Jennings. He was the original owner of the drugstore. Uh -huh. I see you don't have any dates by him either. Um, dates? That's because he was there for so long that I couldn't type them all out there. <laughs> he was there from about, he was there almost the whole period, almost the whole 30 year period. He's so about that big beginning when? About 1890s, all the way through until um, Delashwa takes over. I can look yeah. that up while you're there. Delashwa uh, was there, uh, say, in the 1920s. Right. Uh, Jennings, I think, um, I think Delashwa, look under Delashwa and see. Uh, it'll give you the beginning date, usually, of, of their tenure on the block. Oh, look at Jennings here in my file. Yes, Joseph Jennings enters the block in 1895. And... Something on the top of that. You have something up there. Mm -hmm. He's listed in 1895. Let's see. Thomas Delashwa is rather late in my period. Uh, he just barely sneaks in since I cut off in 1920. Uh, was he there a long time? Uh, no, he had to come in after, after Mr. Jennings and that would be after he finished his school work. Uh -huh. So I would take the Thomas Delashwa and Eric Givens when you're the same age, you know. Okay. Though those gentlemen were finishing uh, medical school. He was a medical doctor? Dr. He was Delashwa. a pharmacist, yes. Okay. Pharmacist, trained in pharmacy. Uh-huh. So it's your impression that he stayed at the Jennings site for some years after Jennings gave up the site, is that right? Well, he came in possession of the drugstore through Mr. Jennings. He did? Yeah. He bought it from him? I don't know. I don't know what the records will show. Uh -huh. That's but interesting. I know he should see uh -huh. Mr. Jennings. Okay. I see, but they have every given stay in 1914, beginning in 1914. And that may uh, have been when the Lashua, somewhere along in there, that Dr. Delashua came to the, the business arena. Mm -hmm. I picked up a T.C. Lashua in the early 1890s. I was wondering, was it Dr. Delashua's name, Thomas? Early 1890s or late 1880s, I pick up a T.C. Lashwa, not a Delashwa, as a boot and shoemaker. And I'm, I'm trying to find out if that was an early business effort of Dr. Delashwa's. It seems like too, too far in advance. 
was one of my teachers too. So I had second grade right along the time that I had the Margaret Lee Crawford uh -huh. in that same building. So it had to be uh, in the night around 1920. And he was a native son, you said? Yes. J.B. Hill? Yes, John Hill. Dr. Lewis, is that his last Lewis name? Mitchell. Lewis Mitchell. Ellen Mitchell. Now, Lewis may have never been on 6th Street. I don't know. Uh -huh. I <laughs> didn't yet. pick him up on 6th Street. May, he may have never been on 6th Street, uh -huh. but he was a native son who was about to uh -huh. uh, The names are not familiar to me, so I mm -hmm. suspect mm -hmm. they might have been on 6th Street. I just looked at the 400 no, blocks. Probably, <laughs> I don't know. I can't. I can't vouch for that. <laughs> And Dr. Webster left here before 1920, I guess. He moved to Waco. And maybe he saw, but, but Dr. Webster is important for your study because he married into the family of descendants of the very first black uh, citizen. Mahalia. Mahalia Mercerson. Uh -huh. uh, he married her granddaughter. Uh -huh. uh, do you happen to remember the granddaughter's name? Effie. Effie. Effie? Effie Webster. But when you check the, you know, city directors of that day, they probably show. Uh -huh. I had picked up that information out of Mr. one of Mr. Uh, Brewer's books. Okay. Yes, he, he was a reveal of interested to see that she was a granddaughter of mine. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know what she did? Effie Webster? Uh, she I, don't know, I, I suppose so. Uh -huh. You know, they left here very early. They, they moved to Waco. Do so. you have any idea why they moved? No. And Mr. I don't, have, don't ever know that even I never even heard of Dr. Webster coming to our back to Austin. I don't know. Well, Mr. Brewer mentions Abner, I mean Webster, and Effie. It's in a publication that's published in about 1940, and at that time he says he mentions Mrs. Webster, who was still living in Waco. So I had deduced from that that they had gone to Waco. Yeah, they moved to Waco. And that by that time Dr. Webster was deceased. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it was, because I do not recall his coming back to the funeral services in the family. So I'm sure. I don't know when he died. He has, his daughter Hodgkin still lives. Yeah? No, no, she lives in Waco. Oh, she lives there. And I don't remember her last name. I have to check it out. She still lives. Okay. And I do not know that his son is still living or not. I thought I understood that his son... I was a druggist, but I don't know that, and I don't, I don't know the son's name either. I don't know what his name is. Uh, let's see, something says to me that she lived on Taylor Street, but I'll have to be sure. I don't know. But we did have contact with her when we did the exhibit. We did. Yes, we had very good contact with her. In fact, she's the one who provided us a picture of Mahalia Murchison. Although Mr. Brewer wrote about her, he did not have an image. And so she provided us the real image of her grandmother. And this was in 1971? Yes, when we did the stuff. exhibit. Uh, Do you know where those original materials are? Were they passed back, given back to the owners? The original the pictures were. We get the all the pictures. Yes, we, well, yes, we made copies. You have not seen the anything of the exhibit? It's on the book only, but I've not Wait, seen it. Wait just a moment. Let me see if I can get this to bring you out. Okay. Okay. I got the feeling that he, these were the these were facilities, and as I said, uh, I, now I don't know that anybody was trying to rent up there. You see, I would think rents. You were renting in an area where you could afford the rent, and I would assume that the higher up you go, see, on on Congress Avenue, we had the higher up toward Congress. right. We had the merchandisers. Mm -hmm. There were the stores. Uh, you didn't have just barber shops. <laughs> As I'm telling you, Mr. Bob Harrison's barbershop was on 7th, right around the corner of Congress. Mm -hmm. 
and he was a black barber that served only whites. And that might be a name you might know. But it's that town, Bob Harrison, and there's a street named after Mr. Harrison right over here, extending from uh, Kamal to Navasota. When he passed away, he was so highly thought of that uh, I'm sure the council did this, and I don't remember the year. Mm -hmm. But he had to pass away after I finished high school because he gave me a, a graduation gift, and I finished in 1931. So I know it had to be after that. Why did he serve only whites? Well, I guess he knew how to cut the hair. I wouldn't be able to tell you, but I guess we have, we had a board on him somewhere, too. I don't know where that is. In your exhibit? Yeah, we had mm -hmm. one board on Bob Harrison. But my understanding was that he cut the hair from the whites. Mm -hmm. Bob Harrison, he's a little brown-skinned man. Mm -hmm. He went into to town every day to do his work. And his his um, barbershop was on 7th, you said? Yeah, I tried to check the directory. It was around on 7th. That would be that first block. That would be 100 block on 7th. I guess that's where it was. <laughs> I have to assume. I don't know. Uh -huh. Well, I but had you, you go up on see on Curse Avenue you had merchandisers. You had jewelry stores. So you have to look at the kinds of businesses. I don't I don't recall any barbershops of them. <laughs> of my days going up Congress Avenue, you know. This is merchandise. You're going uptown for merchandise and the theaters. So you know, I think that uh, so that you you have some free ranges of the kind of business you can have on, on 6th Street. Well, do you have uh, an impression of what types of businesses 6th Street attracted? Well, Was it known for its cafes and its nightlife, for example? No. <laughs> no, not that I know. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> not like today. Oh, no. Oh, well, Austin wasn't that kind of a town. Uh -huh. It was a, a very conservative town, as I see it. Uh, as far as uh, Markham, it was known as a school and church town. And they had very high moral standards, you know. So, you remember this is, you're looking at the time in the days of prohibition, so you didn't even, all this stuff you had. You wouldn't have any bars. When you say 1920, mm -hmm. you know, all the, this business, you know, this, so, so you have service. You have grocery stores. Yes. I do have several grocers. Okay. Grocery stores, you see. And maybe ice cream uh, parlors. One or two. Uh-huh. And cleaners, I guess. And tailors. Uh, tailors. I've got, a bunch, I've got several tailors. Like five or six tailors. Because I saw B.L. Joyce's name on there. Is he a tailor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, very excellent tailor. Well, this shows you... Uh, who lived to be a tailor into my days. That shows you the professions and how, generally how they break down. Mm -hmm. And you, you see, when people came, you see, transportation was a problem. And folk used uh, the horses and their wagons. So you come into town, you come into 6th Street, and you do all of your business. You do uh -huh. your purchasing, you can get your medicines at your drugstore, your groceries, and then you get your hair, all your services, see your doctor, load up, and you go ahead on back to town. So you're coming into the main area. Uh -huh. To do all service your business area. at once. A service uh -huh. area, I would think. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's interesting. I believe. Now, I don't, I don't always lived in the city. So I have to, I'm having to try to pull together something that I did not experience. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, the way you look at it. They would come in, come in. They come in from my income bash, drop the car. Oh, the car. So 6th Street is going to be a main thoroughfare. And you can, and every, it's good. all the services are concentrated in there. You're going to be served. And I guess they may have a place for you to, to hit your horses and your wagons, and I guess. And then you can do the things you need to do and get what you need to do out here. Uh, my aunt tells me that her father would buy the huge sacks of sugar flour because you come once a month or something. You can't be running to the store every day. <laughs> and so, so we're dealing with a different period, I believe. Oh, yes. And this, I think that some of this may be related sure to that is. period. I don't know. This is, not, this is difficult for me to talk about. I don't, I have to... You know, it's, it's so much you got to pull in something down, you don't know much about it, but you try to, but why? You ask the why. So we never got it. Nah, we never had to buy just a lot of any. 
50 pound sacks of anything you buy at the store. I noticed when Ada wrote her books, this is the vein she wrote in. Have you seen her books? The Maybe series? Yes. Well, this is what she, what That's it was right. that you go to town, and then mother gets all measured up, you know. Now, Miss Risinger had a dress shop in the 200 block, mm -hmm. and you can buy, and you get all measured up, and then you take your medicines, and so-and-so goes to the doctor, and you do these things. So, all of the service professions, I would think maybe that's what these would be called. Mm -hmm. And let me have someone do it there. Because, you know, they had uh, some wagon yards down there somewhere. Yes, I know about one of those wagon yards. My uh, husband's great-great-grandfather had one of them. In fact, my husband's great-great-grandfather built the Rosewood Recreation Center. That, that beautiful, that beautiful home. Who, who was your husband? What's your husband's great-grandfather name? Uh, his name was Rudolph Bertram. Um, well, that's such a beautiful place. Is, yeah, it's pretty real oh, were they Germans? Yes. Okay. Well, German. you see, the Germans lived out here first. Mm -hmm. And they, the Figgles lived right over there. Mm -hmm. Figgles. Figgles. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, the Campbells bought that house right in front of the school from the Figgles. Mm -hmm. And then we had the Hangles, and then we had the Eisenbarsers. You know, so the Germans were here. They know. It's interesting to me. They live far apart this year, like to spread out. 40 acres. Uh -huh. That's what Bertram had. Right. And then you could pick, we could pick up other, other names. Uh -huh. But they, now that's what happened in the East. They were here first. And uh -huh. gradually, the blacks moved in. Well, this and was. Gradually, these people moved up. Uh, Bertram bought the, the 40 acres of land in about 1874 and built the house in 75. It was owned by the family until the 1920s when they sold it to the city. Yeah, it was 1929, I think, when they yes. opened the park. Yes. Uh, it was sold in about 27 or 28. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that, is, that was an interesting story of uh, East Austin. I learned that by being on the Landmark Commission. You were on the Landmark Commission? I was a member of the very first group appointed to the Historic right? Landmark Commission. Mm -hmm. When was that? Oh, I don't know, 19. I, oh, something. I'd have to look this. 1970s? Yes, I'm sure. Whenever that came into being. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Whenever it came into being. Ask Betty when it came into being. She, she can tell you. Betty Phillips? Betty Baker? Betty Baker. Uh -huh. No, Betty Phillips didn't come until later. Uh -huh. <laughs> she wasn't even in Austin. Well, I was talking to Betty Baker just the other day. Betty Baker was the one. And she asked me why. I was telling her. I'd say I've done the research on Bertram House because Rudolph Bertram Because all we have is a landmark for the, the cat. That's right. Yeah, that we have a marker for the cat. Uh -huh. There was, you might be interested to know, that there was a cabin originally on that property. Is that true? What did they do with that? Um, I don't know, Ms. Harrison. Stuart's great aunt, Mayta Huffers, whom I knew, and I talked to her a lot, used to tell me about the cabin, that, that they as children used to play in it. The three little girls, the grandchildren of both of them, lived out there for years.
Christian, he was a German painter, 19th century mm -hmm. transplant painter from Germany. And he was the subject of a book published in the 1970s by the Institute of Texas Cultures in San Antonio. And he was a friend of Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And he painted a painting with the Rosewood Recreation Center in it. The house is featured in the painting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that painting still exists in the hands of a descendant of the family who now lives in New Hampshire and New York oh, somewhere. I see. And I just recently learned this as I was doing the research on, on Bertram that that would be a fun, I'd love to have a reproduction oh, of yeah. that painting because the house is still in Austin that and is it is a well-known, it is. Uh, it's a symbolic place for us right. now. Mm -hmm. It, would, it might be interesting. In fact, I should ask the director over there if he would, he might like to have a photographic display of the house in different areas. It would be. Because I have some family photographs oh. showing the house. I have oh, several family oh, photographs oh, showing the house before uh -huh. it was sold to the city. That would be sort of an interesting thing for them to have. It surely would be. The history of any house. Yeah. Yeah. And the general history of the house. And the Germans were great craftsmen, you know, and the houses that they built. You know, they had interesting. I noticed above the windows they, they made little carvings. And you always tell when you go in one whether they had German craftsmanship. Because you had a, there's a little square thing and then the little thing above that. Uh, they, they didn't just put that like that. No, <laughs> this decorative. That's decorative. Right. Uh -huh. It's very decorative. Uh -huh. And then this comes down and it's ridged, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. All around, all of the windows, and every you can go in the houses. And you can go in any number of houses. I can take my son Bernard up there. There were lots, several German families up there. I didn't know all of them, but they were up there. Yeah, and you can tell by the houses. There's one right straight up on the corner, right on the corner, across from West. It's still standing. Uh, there was another down in the middle of a block, uh, 1190 block. They tore that two-story house down. Somebody has built a brick house, but it was a two-story house. All, all I know is that a man lived there, a younger man, who was one of the sons, I guess, named Paul, and he married the Eisenbauer's daughter, Emma. Now, what is that? I don't remember. That's where they live. And they seem like they had such fun. They would be playing the piano and singing, you know, <laughs> stuff that they ain't fun with. They stay up for a long time. A long time. And the sheep is at market right there. Oh, he's still there. And then the other sheep had a market further up. Well, uh, Eric had his market on San Bernard. And that little house, little business place is standing there right across from the Westbrook. That was a market. And then there's a large area yard where he kept his cattle. And then his home was next door. And then his brother had a big market up on East 11th. Well, I'm learning more about it. I didn't it expect to learn more about the Germans, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they, they were, uh, well, since they concentrated out here, right. there, were lot, there were lots of Germans out here. Mm -hmm. There was a, the guest wines were over across the street in another store. And then it was a happy go lucky store, and I don't know if remember what the name of those people were. I think they said it was I had my little sisters. You know, store keepers. Well, I expect that in order to choose who should, who should be profiled in this exhibit, that some of these people are going to be very well known to the to the older community members who have interested in themselves in history. You will know much about these people. I mean, there will be a few surprises. I'm hoping that I will discover that there's some other people who are representative of a certain profession that was a long-term professional that block that maybe isn't so well known that we can pull out some new data. You know, that's what I'm hoping. I'm not sure. We'll have to see. I haven't yet decided firmly who these profiles are going to be. And I won't decide that. So I'm going to be talking to people about, you know, 20 or 30 different possible candidates, and then I'll cut down, I'll narrow down the candidates. Get ready for the exhibit material. Yes. 
I have a list of people who I'm going to go and call uh, yeah. to, to, to see what and see what you can find out about uh, some of the other people. Maybe some of them might, as I said, I'll try to bring you the book. The book so you can look or find it on the library. And which one is that? Mr. This is the uh, anniversary I've program seen, of I've the seen, Metropolitan yes, Church. I've got that one, 1907. Yes. I've got that one. Okay. Uh, well, that's can, a major source. Okay, you can find uh, certainly information about Dr. Crawford. That's right. Well, I think you can find informa some information about Dr. Stevens, I think, Dr. Crawford. There's not anything in it about Dr. Brown. No, I'm not finding very much about Dr. Brown. But, uh, uh, do you know why? Can you explain that? Was he? I, I don't know. I don't, I, well, he didn't stay too long. He, he left too in the night. I guess uh, early night. Uh, mm -hmm. no, he left after, after 1922. And he went to Dallas. He moved to Dallas. Uh -huh. You know, someone I really want to know more about is Shara, Sarah Howland right. Shelton. <laughs> Is the first dentist, well, I, first I female dentist. I don't know. How, how do you think you're going to find out about her? I'm going to ask you. Okay. I think Ada knows about her. <laughs> okay. I don't know what Ada knows about her or not. Hmm. I'm, I'm just going to ask everybody oh, yeah, I talk to. Yeah, well, I good. Because I just, I just pick her up at, for three or four years in the city directory, and I only knew she was a female because mm -hmm. the last three years she lists herself as S.H. Shelton. And the first year oh, you she lists that? herself as Sarah Hallam. You, you were saying she came here in 1920. Uh, or a little earlier, uh, not much earlier, 1916 or so. So you see, what what Ada will know will be about people who have been here. Uh, and she, uh, uh, went out into the community. You know. This is a long shot. I admit. She was. See, she she came late, but she was here only a few. Years. I don't know where she went. I know almost nothing about her. One, one idea I had is just write the same letter to all of the different educational institutions that had uh, dentistry specialties okay. at that time and just say, could you please yeah, check well your... Yeah, now that would be good. I mean, that would, that's a scam. Now that's going to be a sure. It would be the only... The only uh, how, do you have a... Uh, what about the census? I have not would, checked the census. See, that's if she ever appeared on the census... Uh, right, you have to write the age. Washington or something. You the 1920 census will be here at Barker. Okay. That's a okay. good idea. Okay. See, then you will have to go to something that would rather give some, you know, data. Because too much of this has gone. I know. I know. I'm just, I'm just going to get little scraps. Okay, you know? yeah. And it was interesting that you did find uh, something about Dr. Crawford, his, his funeral program. I've got a stack of papers on Dr. Crawford. No, on um, Givens. It's Givens. Oh, yeah, that, that's Givens. And I yes, got, yes, yes. I was glad to get that obituary. Yeah, yeah, See, I've yeah. checked most of these people. I've checked for obituaries, and I can't find them. Right. And I know some of them died in Austin. Why yes, can't I find them? Yes, Well, they, the paper just didn't carry them. Now, I would think that would be a part of the prejudices, you know, the value of people. That's right. You know. I came across the fact that for a spell, perhaps in the 1920s, the papers didn't carry any obituaries. Without a fashion or something, oh, they just okay. quit getting. Okay. Well, uh, and if you look at, have you ever reviewed the anniversary issue of American Statesman? No. Well, it would be interesting if you could get your fingers on that. They didn't carry any news about blacks either, except uh, uh, for something that was not very respectable. <laughs> so now that also uh, was perhaps a policy of the paper. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, we saw nothing in there. You go through there, and you just don't find anything. But that's that's why
directory, I found the Shelton and Everett Gibbons are the only black dentists listed in the business section. And Sarah, of course, is the only woman of 21 listings at that time. 1916, Sarah Shelton is a dentist in the 500 block of East 6th. She's still the only woman listed in the business section. And she's one of two black dentists listed. 1918, 1920, I've got her. No entry then by 1922. She's gone. Ellen Mitchell was your poster. Okay, okay, I was telling you about this. Yes, that's, that's the one. one. Okay. Yeah. See what happened at this medical address, Miss Harrison, which I think is really interesting. Uh -huh. Shelton leaves and Mitchell takes uh -huh. her place. And this happens with the doctors, too. And I think he later took came in here because Mit uh, Mitchell went to Houston for a span. Uh -huh. And I think he later took okay. in some way. I don't know whether he was on this side or the other side. Well, well, Mitchell may be able to be one of my people because this is in 1922. Now, the city directory list always come after now, we can actual tell, time. We so can this would have been tell you a lot more about Lewis. <laughs> Good. Because he was here and, and, and uh, you know, he, he lived right down in San Bernard's here. So his daddy was a mail carrier. Uh -huh. you know. It seems like this tape should be out. Let me check it for just a minute.